Welcome to That Seth and Weird. I'm Seth, one of the podcast co-hosts. Thank you for listening, and please follow us on YouTube, Instagram, Spotify, or your platform of choice for podcasts. It means a lot to us. All right, welcome back again to Real to Real. This is the show where Brent, a.k.a. Grindhouse Zombie, and myself, the Reverend Michael Snakebite, a.k.a. Clark. I guess we go by our opposite names. Uh, <laughs> uh, come to you every week, and uh, we break down a year of movies, and then we um, pick a movie to go back and forth together, and then we uh, let you guys vote on what we thought our best movies of that particular year were, and the winning vote will come out uh, to be the uh, month closeout. And this month, uh, yeah, the year that, that whole like, thing was clear was clearly a fucking mistake. I'm just going to say it now. We should rethink the whole premise of this. Um, no, I'm kidding. I'm just really unhappy with our viewers' choice, our listeners' choice. But I'm trying not to be too yeah. mad. But yeah, I you know, and I'm kind of shocked, honestly, because I picked three movies um, for, you know, my three movies of 1999 that I thought either any one of them could have actually been picked for best movie of 1999. And I'm actually kind of also a little, I'm not going to say I'm miffed because I'm an, I, I actually have never talked about this movie ever in any kind of previous podcast I've ever been on. So it will be new to me, but at the same time, um, yeah, I am surprised that this will be the the movie that we're talking about. Uh, so 1999's number one movie that was voted on that we're going to speak about is The Sixth Sense. Um, Yay. <laughs> and uh, I know Grindhouse is not very happy about this, but... Um, we can break it down. I think we can actually find some things to talk about. I think we can get deep into this. So I, I'm I'm actually not upset because I think this movie, whether you like it or not, or whether, you know, 30 years down the road or whatever, or 20 years down the road. Oh, yeah, it's 1999. So we're 20 years down the road. Uh, 25. It's 25 year anniversary, isn't it? It's math. Um, Math. Yeah, math. yeah, we okay. hate mathing here. So 25 years down the road, it's not... Uh, I don't know if you want to say this aged well or not. We're going to get into it, but um, there's a lot to talk about with this movie, I believe. Whether it's good or bad, and whether you want to break it down, whether you want to tear it down, or whether you want to actually say, well, hey, I didn't think about that. This is actually kind of cool at the time. Maybe we got to put ourselves back into the mood of 1999. But either way, this is Real to Real. Welcome to your first uh, month closing episode where we have to <laughs> we have to break this down, whether we want to or not. This is the movie that was chosen. This was voted on uh, by all the fans. Um, so The Sixth Sense, this is the number one movie of 1999. Brent, what you think, man? Well, this is the risk you take when you solicit outside opinions. I, I understand that. Um, <clears throat> all things been equal, I would rather categorize, name, and discuss the personalities of each of my hemorrhoids, if you'd rather do that. Um, uh, uh, okay, uh, I, I'll, I'm going to preface here. I don't hate the sixth sense. I don't hate it. Okay. But in my world, it just isn't as good a movie as everybody else on the planet seems to think it is. Now, I am extremely comfortable being the naysayer in the room. I, I mean, it, some would say that's kind of my lot in life. Um, it was a fine movie. It's just, it's not great. And everybody thinks it's great. And I don't know if it's because M. Night Shyamalan and Ding Dong directed it and wrote it, or... Uh, it had Bruce Willis in one of his more dramatic roles. I mean, I, and to be perfectly honest, I would argue that this is not even really a horror movie. Um, but let's just let's just get it out of the way so I can go do something else. 
All right. Well, let me ask you the question first off is where were you in life when this movie came out and what was your first experience seeing it? Where was I in life? Oh, good God. Um, well, 25 years ago, oddly enough, I was 25. I had whew, one kid. There was uh, another kid coming within a couple of years, got married. Uh, when the hell did I get married? Shit, I should probably remember that. The first time, anyway. Um, I don't remember. It doesn't matter. I think the following year I got married. So I was pretty well situated in life, you know, living out in the world, doing my own thing, having a job. Um, I don't think I saw this one in the theater um, back then. You know, having one kid and having a wife to be and having to pay rent and everything like that. It, the movies were sort of a luxury back in the day. So, um, but I did first see this. It came as um, when I bought my first DVD player, it came as one of the free DVDs. Uh, back when, you know, a DVD player was 600 bucks and they enticed you with a pile of free DVDs to get you started. It was one of the freebies. Um I think I might actually still have it around here somewhere, too. Um, and like I said, the first time I watched it, it was a fine movie. Um, you know, I'm not going to say it blew my mind or anything, but I, you know, I, I watched it, to be honest, because it was free. Um, and it it had a lot of talk around it and everybody, you know, it was it became sort of part of the zeitgeist. It was one of those really talked about movies and. I'll be honest, when I saw it, I was like, well, I mean, I don't, I, I never got what all the hubbub was about. Um, and as you and I have kind of previously already talked, once you see it one time and you know the big spoiler, there's never a reason to watch this movie again. There just isn't. I mean, the whole story is the spoiler. Um, and once that's all chiseled away, it's like, I, I told you today, I've watched this movie 1.25 times. And it's because I got 25% of the way through the second time. And I'm like, why am I watching this again? <laughs> I turned it off. Um, yeah. Uh, you like this movie. I don't. So let's uh, let's uh, get in the ring and settle this once and for all. All right. So um, before I get into where I was when I saw this movie, which I did see this movie in theaters when it came out. So I got that full experience, and I was 14 at the time, uh, I believe, when I saw this, 14 or 15, uh, when I saw this movie, um, which the math does check out there. I'm 10 years younger than you, so. <laughs> uh, Rub it in. Yeah, sorry. Oh, we yeah, have got so much more going for me in 10 years. <laughs> but uh, no, we're... Um, I remember this being uh, the same way you say it was like a cultural experience. It was, there was a lot of like a buzz around it when it came out. And this was definitely M uh, night Shalaman's, um, I guess explosion. Like it was, it, as far as I know, it was his first big breakout movie. I don't know if he actually was, uh, had directed anything beforehand that was, like of note, uh, maybe indie movies or anything like that. But this was the first like big breakout movie. Mm -hmm. um, and it kind of made him a rock star. And we'll probably get into this later, but I kind of hate it for him because I think um, he kind of did his magnum opus like right out the gate. And uh, there are some movies afterward that I really do appreciate by him. And maybe we'll tackle those in the future. I kind of would like to, maybe we should do an M night um, series later down the road and maybe ranking his movies, because I do believe he's got value in his uh, filmmaking and storytelling but, uh, you know, it's gotten lost after this movie. This movie kind of blew it for a lot of his later movies because people just got over the formula, I guess, to say. But let's go through some facts real quick because I want to do this. So The Sixth Sense obviously came out in 1999. That was the movie, uh, the year we were covering. 
uh, for this month. And it stars Bruce Willis, as we said, um, Hilly Joel Osment, which he was, uh, he did a child actor credit in Forrest Gump. Everyone knows him as Little Forrest. And then this was like his big breakout movie. Um, and then he did some things after with like, you know, pay it forward and things like that. And then kind of had to drop off for a little bit. Um, Tony Collette kind of comes out of nowhere as a, you know, comeback. Um, Olivia Williams plays uh, Bruce Willis's wife. Um, and then there's a, kind of a smattering of people around there. Donnie Wahlberg, who lost a ton of weight to do the, um, was it Vincent Gray, I believe is his name. Mm -hmm. uh, in the very beginning. Um, the shooter. Yep. Yes. Yes. Which is a very, this actually shocked me when I was in theater, because like I said, once again, I was actually kind of sheltered up until I was about 14 or 15. So when I saw this movie in theater, that was actually a very shocking scene right at the beginning. And we'll get into the plot here in a second. Um, but uh, I did mention also Misha Barton um, kind of pre- uh, we were talking earlier and I, I made a joke about Misha Barton, you know, kind of her pre breakout. Uh, I think she was on the OC. I think that's the show that she really broke out on, but, um, uh, she's in this movie as well. Um, but yeah, this movie to me, I don't know when it came out. I, I love ghost stories. I'm obsessed with ghost stories. I'm, Kind of an avid paranormal, like paranormal ghost hunter guy. Um, I don't particularly believe in ghosts, but I, I'm obsessed with legends and I'm obsessed with history. And I love that kind of um, connection with it. So a movie like this means a lot to me. Like when you see places that hold history and they hold like spirits to them, like the idea of ghost stories um, means a lot to me. So this movie appealed to me like right out the gate. Um, and obviously I didn't know anything about that, uh, the director or anything going into this. But uh, what do you think going into the plot, like the first 15 minutes of this movie, um, setting the stage of Bruce Willis coming back from a promotion and, or it was a degree I think he got. And, uh, and then Donnie Wahlberg scene where it's like the, you know, the, the patient he failed kind of thing shooting him. Like, what did you, th when you saw this movie, did you actually have any kind of emotional impact from the beginning of this? Well, I mean, I, I suppose I had the, the, the normal impact that anybody would, where you've got this, you know, they're giving you this character, and he's supposed to be this guy who's doing so well, and he's doing everything right, and then here comes this, this quote-unquote, you know, failed patient who's pissed off about it. And, you know, from going back, so I, my father, before he, he passed away, way early on in my life, um was diagnosed as a bipolar manic depressive. So knowing the the rant and the rave of the uh, psychiatric patient whose doctor has failed them was nothing new to me. Um, and you'd think that with my dad, that would have hit harder. And oddly enough, it did the opposite. It, it hit lighter. Like, yeah, I've been here before. Yeah, okay, so so what? I mean, I... and. He, you know, for, for all the times you and I have talked and you know, all the other things we've talked about in life, it's, I understand when they try to give you those things and they try to make them, you know, like hit you personally. And I often wish that storytellers would just stop doing that because I'm, I'm 50 years old. I've lived enough life where trying to appeal to my emotional side, it's just going to piss me off. That's all it's going to do. Um, and so with this movie, it was like, honestly, I thinking back on it, my first thought when it came to the Vincent Gray characters, stop whining, little bitch. That that was what my character was. Um, because from what I know about it, and I'm not, again, not judging anybody or not throwing anybody under the bus. But from what I learned about my dad is the people that actively participate in their betterment do better. 
The people that don't, don't. That's what I learned from it. So what I took away from that was that guy just wasn't trying hard enough. He wasn't doing his part. He wasn't doing his homework. He wasn't taking his medication. And it made me just hate that character. Like, okay, so you're kind of a just a big baby. You know, you're not you're not doing your part and you're blaming somebody else. And again, from what I know about that, that's a very standard thing where they don't take medication, don't do therapies, don't do things like that. And then their world falls, falls apart and then they want to blame somebody else. So that whole thing, when it first started, honestly, it just irritated the shit out of me. And then when we fast forward and it appears as though our main character is pulled through, it was like my first thought was, well, you know, at least the guy turned the gun on himself so he won't be a danger to anybody else. It's cold. I get that it's cold, but that's what that's what my life had taught me about those moments. And when you said fast forward, <clears throat> are you also saying fast forward realizing that uh, he not necessarily was suffering from like schizophrenia, but but the titular um, suffering is the sixth sense. That connection as it's made later. I mean, do we need to go through plot, uh, go through the story more? Well, okay, so here's the thing. So I've also, I mean, this is going to, I don't want to rip this apart, but all things being equal, when I watched this movie the first time, I figured it out right away. So it sort of took something out of it for me. Um, but the thing that it did make me think about, um, and that's just based on throughout the entire movie, the amount of interactions that Bruce Willis's character has with other characters. Um, there's this piece of me that wonders if, if those two guys weren't dead already. Um, so I wonder about that. But then the thing that bugs me the most about this movie, and, it, and honestly, it just bugs the shit out of me, is that when he first meets Cole, he doesn't believe him, right? And he thinks he's psychotic or schizophrenic or something like that. But knowing what you know later and what I quickly had figured out, like if he's in, he's in the quote-unquote ghost realm, it's like he should have been able to... I mean, it, I don't think being a ghost is like... Like, like why is it a fucking secret? Like, I don't, I don't think it's a secret. You know, I think that he would have been privy to everything that Cole could see. You know, he would have been because he was in that world. And I mean, once you find out and it's cemented, that is my. My absolute coup d'etat gripe about this movie is that. I mean, he it's I mean, I know they don't maybe necessarily hand out like an invitation or like a welcome brochure when you're dead. Like, I get that. But at the same time, it's like, are you going to tell me that, like, I'm going to die and walk around the world and I'm going to have no idea that I'm dead? Just kind of flies in the face of everything that we at least postulate about being dead. So it's like then to doubt this kid. I mean, it's just it's another one of those things where it just bugs the shit out of me, where it's like, I don't. You should know all of this and to be able to digest it should be easy, you know, so. But I mean, it wouldn't be the first movie where we had a ghost that. Either didn't know or wasn't able to accept that they were dead, so. OK. Right. Yeah, and I definitely am not. Somebody who logically subscribes to that would be what the afterlife would look like, but I kind of do understand the idea of like an energy that will manifest itself like he does in the situations he does like he fills in the gaps i guess um so if he's at the date with his wife or if he is sitting at the house with uh cole's mother and you know like every time we see him kind of there in a position he like it's kind of like his manifestation because he knows he needs to talk to Cole because Cole's the only one that can talk to him or he's like somehow the same way these other ghosts have latched on to Cole. They're like, oh, we know this guy can see us. This guy can feel us. This guy can 
um, be our portal back to the real world so we can get our like shit done, whatever it is that they want done. But he's doing it as a psychotherapist. So he's literally like, putting himself like that's where he does and he acts like he's going about his day but he's actually not going about his day he's just he's still just one of these spirits that are doing that kind of thing they're 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 psycho manifesting their energy is coming together to form and he's the only one seeing them and i don't know i i kind of get that idea that people feel that there are um and like I said, I, I'm 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 not going into crazy psychic babble here to be like, oh yeah, people can see ghosts and say like no. I mean take that as you will. I mean, I don't want any of our listeners to be like, oh, you don't have any kind of like um, you know, touch into the other realm. But at the same time, you know, that's what I feel like with this movie is like, I feel like uh, what the idea he's trying to get across um, is that this guy feels like he's, the spirit is feeling like it's living its normal life like it was doing. And what it's actually doing is manifesting itself anywhere it can, uh, doing its, doing what it would have done with its day-to-day -day life centered around this kid because this kid is like some kind of beacon, some kind of like psychic beacon to like channel this energy. So, um, that's why he always appears around it. And that's, that's, that, that's the idea I get around. Okay. Well, fair like, enough. But I mean, if you are honest about it, knowing what you know about the character, about Bruce Willis's character and his ability to not interact with the world that he's in, you, but knowing that they were trying to change all these things, like the the one character being poisoned by the mother and all these other things, it, Bruce Willis's character, if he was not there, everything would have been the same anyway. So who cares? Well, I mean, do you I think... I mean, he, he, he held the hand of the kid, I will give you that, and sort of talked the yeah. kid off the ledge a little bit. But fundamentally... I don't think the out like there wasn't it doesn't seem like there was any worldly outcomes that were like supremely altered by Bruce Willis's presence or his at least his character's presence. No, but I think it I think that is the crux of the movie is that the um so M. Night Shalaman, which I firmly believe uh he writes child stories. He writes Fantasies. He writes bedtime stories in adult fashion, in simplistic ways as he can. Um, we can do this in the future. We can talk about like Lady in the Water. We can talk about Signs. We can talk about other movies. But he he almost tells bedtime stories like as simplistic as he can. To for me, it's meant to be like, hey. This is movies for adults, but they're actually children's stories. Well, I and think that's the, fair. That's a fair assessment. But then if you get. Well, here, let's just tangent for a second, but tangentially tangent. If we were to have a if we were to have an M. Night Shyamalan retrospective, um, I think that you and I probably would disagree on almost every movie. Um, and I, I, I just I just think so, based on the ones that I know that I find really good and the ones that I find to be more just fucking tea and crumpets bullshit that's made to please the audiences. Um, that said, I mean, maybe the maybe the. The repackaged bedtime story is a way to look at it, and I think with Sixth Sense, that's probably accurate. But then how do you do things like Old or a Knock at the Cabin? Mm -hmm. None of those is what I would call a kid's bedtime story. Um, you know, you can't talk about a pharmaceutical company trying to change the world and or, you know, uh, the four horsemen of the apocalypse. Those are definitely not bedtime stories, you know. So, But with Sixth Sense, maybe it's maybe there's some logic to it. But are they not, are not either one of those kind of stripped down 
more simplified. I, I, and I'm not saying they're meant to be stories for children to watch. I'm saying they are the most childlike versions of adult movies. Um, they they the same thing with Sixth Sense. Same thing with uh, like I said, they're they're meant to be kind of fairy tales, and they're meant to be like like even Devil. Uh, like things like that, where it's just like, you know, people are just like, oh my God, they roll their eyes about the toast. It always falls butter side down or whatever. And things like, it's like, no, things are meant to be kind of silly and just kind of stripped down. And old does that as well. And I would say, uh, I see. I disagree. I just, I disagree on old completely. I don't think old does that at all. Old. Old manages never, to a to. You never had a um, well, okay for oh we we definitely tangent it on here but okay well uh, old you well okay yeah. okay let's just let, let, let let's just un, un- yeah. tangent and go back to what we're saying and we'll end with you're wrong and we'll talk about it later. <laughs> okay, that's fine. I think we just um, I think we just introduced uh potentially M Night Month. As soon as you start pronouncing his name right, we can have an M. Night Shyamalan month. I would love to do that. Shyamalan, not Shalaman. Shalaman is not right. Shyamalan. 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 Okay, it's almost I phonetic. I think I say you, it slow because I'm Southern. You say, well, I, well, I was wondering if it was a Southern thing, but you're saying Shalaman, and I don't see an... Shalaman. 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 Nope. Shalaman. No, M. Night Shyamalan. M. Night Shyamalan. 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 Well, just say it, how, say it however you want to say it and then throw a good it at the end and then we'll just call it good. Come on, <laughs> come on, come on, come on. Start your engines. Come on, y'all. We're going to watch a Shyamalan movie. Okay. We got uh, a Shyamalan movie. <laughs> no, I think it's probably, I think maybe we save that for one of our months with five weeks. I think we should do that because yeah. I think it would be an interesting breakdown because, I mean, as far as old goes, as far as the, the fairy tale aspect, I could not disagree more. And definitely with Knock at the Cabin, I could not disagree more. Those are not fairy tale stories. Now, you could look at it from the I perspective have of... I have a of, of, way Knock at the Cabin, but old, I can still, I think I can still make an argument for. Um... Well, okay. Like I said, you're you're wrong with that. That's okay. We'll talk about it later. <laughs> this is your winner. Get us back on track here, Clark. <laughs> I was to say, I have no clue how to get back on track to... Uh, <laughs> that was actually more... That was better discourse than actually talking about the sixth sense. <laughs> uh, it probably... It honestly probably was. I mean, well, to get us back on track, I mean, so after the whole opening of the movie and we do the... It's the months later. Um, you know, he meets this he meets this kid who reminds him of the Vincent character, which is I think where he gets suckered in, which is just stupid. That's why psychologists should not quote unquote take their work home. They should leave it at the office. Um uh, but so he's using that as like he's gotta help this kid to sort of vindicate himself from his perceived failure with, with Vincent. Um, and then reconcile with his wife. Um, and, but it's like, they give you this, like, I I made that the hardest part. It's like, okay, so I survived this shooting, but at the same time, my whole life is falling apart. So it's almost like, and I, I remember thinking this too, and it's like, so what did I even survive for? What difference did it make? You know, so this kid is going to be the difference. It's what's going to solve all of his problems. And it's like, again, when you're a psychologist, don't take your work home. You know, do your psychology and then come home. And if you've got problems at home, deal with those separately. Don't think that one is going to fix the other. It's life is more complicated than that. Um, So that whole dynamic also just frustrated me. And speaking of being frustrated. Put the cat down for the third time. I mean, anyway, so, I mean, meeting Cole and then meeting Cole's mother, I mean, it's all, 
it's all fairly good stuff and it's all fairly compelling. Um, but, you know, that moment where Cole confides in Malcolm and he's like, I see dead people. I mean, and, you know, I see dead people was an internet meme before people knew what an internet meme was, you know? Mm -hmm. um, and so, I, I mean, is that good, bad, or otherwise that you're a line in a movie got turned into a meme? I don't, I don't know. Um, but, I mean, it kind of even then, it, when, when Malcolm's like, you know, he doesn't really believe the kid. You know, he's like, no, this kid's got some deeper problems. And I mean, and to his credit, he's trying to, you know, he's trying to put a diagnosis on the case. But at the same time, through trying to put a diagnosis on it, he's like, this is just garden variety. And like, I shouldn't be dealing with this, which I think is honestly kind of one of the shittier things in the movie where he's like, I, I'm not going to treat this kid. I'm just going to get rid of him. Um, but then, you know, he does that. He listens to that tape from the session and he hears a bunch of things that kind of confuse him. And he's like, well, what the hell? Um, well, so on it, that tape, that been gray. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. So it's yeah. like, well, you know, that's kind of when he realizes that the kid's probably telling the truth and that this ability to like talk with ghosts and, you know, help them quote unquote, get their business done. It's like, I, I, I'll still say it, it, it's interesting. It, it, the, the whole thing is interesting. It's ghosts. I, I'm interested in the same things that you are. I just, overall, for me, this movie just did not, it didn't deliver the grand ghost story I wanted. And maybe I'm short-sighted or maybe I'm whatever, but it just, it didn't do for me what it did for you. It's fair enough. And I'll present, um... I'm going to present another ghost story movie to you, and I want to see if you have a feeling um, of one that did it better. So uh, a movie that came out not too long after this um, uh, was uh, What Lies Beneath. So that's a, also getting a shaking head. Not a good ghost movie? Not to me, so, um, no. So, like, as a subtle ghost movie, something that's not meant to be overtly, like, I don't know, horror-based. Something, so this came out, and then um, White Noise came out not too long after this also. And now that's a horror, more, like, horror-driven ghost movie, I guess. But I just feel like The Sixth Sense does a... It just did something at the time that there weren't movies doing. And it was more of um, building tension without a lot of, like it took a long time for any kind of jump scare or anything like that. And then when there weren't jump scares, sometimes they were really terrifying. And then sometimes they were just kind of like, like a, a relief, like a, a breath, you know, like a exhale. Um, And I think this movie just did something that a lot of, I, once again, it, I've had people argue with me in the past that it's not a horror movie. And it might not be. It's a thriller, possibly. But just that it builds tension and it does a lot of world building and it does a lot of um, callbacks like color like the color red during this entire movie means something anytime there's the color red there's a ghost around um i don't know i just kind of find this movie fascinating because i think it was it was just really well shot it was you know well acted and uh and it just you know the twist obviously is what really made it i guess famous but at the same time um you know, I can kind of, I can kind of get behind you saying like, does this movie really stand the test of time? No, I mean, it, does it deserve its place on a top one hundred AFI kind of thing? I kind of say, yeah, because for what it did. But there's a lot of movies. There's a lot of movies on the AFI top one hundred that don't deserve to be on there anymore. 
So that that's just where I'm going to go with it. Like it it did a thing. It touched on something that wasn't there at the time and it got to be a cultural phenomenon and it just it, it did it did its thing. So I kind of respect the movie for what it did and was it, you know, M Night's best? Arguable. Um some people think that was his best and everything was down from there. I don't believe that honestly. But um, but yeah, that's, that's just kind of how I feel about that movie. I mean, well, I can't, I can't argue that it was well cast, well shot. The story was decent. I'm, I'm, I'm not going to argue any of those things. That's not what I'm doing. Um, what I'm arguing is the accolades. That's what I'm arguing. I don't understand the accolades. Um, and I'll reiterate that once once we know that Bruce Willis is actually a ghost, it pokes a bunch of holes in the rest of the fucking story. Um, and that, for me, ends up being problematic. Like, I mean, either, either the character of Malcolm should have not been able to do most of what he was doing and not be as influential as he was, or he should have, and I think this is more likely, he would have had a shit ton more information and could have given all this information to the kid in one shot and been like, okay, on your way and just go and never talk to him again. The, the enduring relationship was kind of pointless to me. Um, and then, you know, getting, and this, I, I mean, okay, I'm, I'm, I'm picking it. I'm starting to pick it apart now, but fuck it, whatever. That's what we're doing here. The end of this movie is mind-numbingly boring and so neatly wrapped up that it just makes me want to throw up a little bit. It's like, oh, I have a gunshot wound. Oh, there's no wedding ring. Oh, everyone's happy now. And there's this burst of light, and he's like... I mean, I think even the first time I watched it, I was just like, fucking really? Like, that's how you're going to end this? I mean, give well, me something where we're going to go on to something bigger. We're going to do something better. We're going to solve the Kennedy assassination. Fucking something. <laughs> but no. I think, I think this was definitely M. Night being like, hey... Look at all the details I went through for this entire movie for you people. Like, and, uh, and not knowing, he, hey, maybe it was his one shot kind of thing, and he didn't realize it was going to be as big as it was. Because, you know, he does repeat that in other movies. He does it in Signs, obviously. He does mm -hmm. it in... Uh, and so, I mean, he, he wants people to see, like, oh, look, I had this planned from the beginning. I set all these little, like, breadcrumbs down, and did you pick them up? Did you see the secrets? Do you know, did you figure the puzzle out? So, I mean, yeah. It, I will definitely give you that, that aging poorly when you look at it that way. Like, had he never made another movie, would you think this would be okay? I think it's okay now. I, I think it's I mean, okay now. Okay. Like I said, I'm not I'm not saying that I hate the movie, and I'm not saying that it's a bad movie. I think it's okay. I just don't understand how it ends up on everyone's lists of the greatest of this, that, and the other thing of all time. I just don't understand it because it does not for for it to be on one of those lists, it's gotta check a lot of boxes for me, and it didn't check any of them. You know, there was nothing outstanding about it to me. There was a lot of okay. Just there's nothing outstanding. You know. Signs is a way better movie. Um, you know, I'm going to argue that Knock at the Cabin is a way better movie. I'm going to get hinky for our later conversation and say that Old is a way better movie. It's about, for me, ultimately, what I enjoy and what speaks to me. And Signs did not speak to me at all. But that said, Unbreakable didn't speak to me. Glass didn't speak to me. Um, Split did a little bit. Um, everybody hates the happening, and I I realize how not good it is. But there's a little piece of me that likes the happening a little bit. 
um, just for how fucking cockamamie it is, you know, um, and that somebody had the nerve to do it. And I guess that's ultimately what I like about um, M. Night Shyamalan is that he just does it. You know, he just does it, and I don't think he really gives a shit what you think, you know? But I think him continuing to do that is what gave us all these other movies, you know? I thought The Lady in the Water was pretty good. I didn't think it was great. A lot of people think it's great. Didn't think it was great. Now, Signs? Signs is great. Signs is truly great. But it was story, cast, delivery. Every nuanced moment in that film was superbly well done whereas i don't with the sixth sense a lot of it was not it wasn't well done and then like we talked about earlier once you know what's going on the rewatchability on um the sixth sense drops to zero for me it's just you know because once i know what as soon as i know what the what the truth is my mind starts to pick it apart and go 80 percent of this movie was unnecessary like to get the story across and so maybe that's where the the fairy tale thing that you're talking about comes from. Maybe it would have been better off as a short film or something like that and would have been maybe a little bit more impactful. But it just never spoke to me, man. Well, would you... Uh, let's put it in horror movie terms here for a second since we're both horror movie fans. Could you say that something like... Um, something like The Sixth Sense is similar to Halloween being kind of groundbreaking to open up the door for a lot of people to do it better or a lot of not even not a lot of people but even M. Night Shyamalan himself like doing it better later down the road well if you want to talk I mean so doing what better just call it the ghost story um, like, well yeah well, I was uh, you know I'm just saying like doing that formula of whole giving you the clues and then like the twist at the end kind of thing because people tried to mimic that for a long time well i mean i don't think well okay i'll give the movie this um most of the people that i know that had watched that movie didn't see that coming um no i did see it coming but i'm also when it comes to films, I am horrendously analytical, like to a fault almost, where sometimes it makes movies not fun to watch. So there's times I have to like try to turn that off. Um, and I did see the twist coming. Um, as far as movies that followed it and tried to sort of mimic its style, um, yeah, I'm not going to call it, I'm not going to call it foundational any stretch of the imagination because I don't believe it is. Um, like I said before, I think this movie is overrated as hell. Um, but I mean, for that era and for the follow-ups that came after it and the multitudes of people that tried to copy it, um, I can see it, but I'll be perfectly honest, and I think it comes more from what it did at the box office than what the story was. I mean, you don't have a movie that makes $700 million at the box office and not have people try to copy it. Um, and I will maintain from this chair forever and ever that it's, I don't think it has anything to do with how good the movie was. I think it moved, that it made a shitload of money. Fair enough. And exploded a career of one director. <laughs> yes. M. Night Shyamalan. I'm not even going to try to say it anymore because I, I... <laughs> I'm just fucking with you because I can. <laughs> uh, well, and here's the thing. Ultimately, I'm glad that it did because we got, you know, a lot of his future movies. And, you know, like I said, I'm happy, happy to pick apart the filmography because it, there's so many in here that people just think are, you know, I mean, the follow up Unbreakable. That was a snooze fest to me. Absolute snooze fest. Signs was magic. The village was okay. Lady in the Water was pretty good. The happening was okay. The last airbender was a pile of dog shit. After Earth was a pile of dog shit. 
the visit was okay. Split was okay. Glass, eh. Old was really good, I thought. And Knock at the Cabin was really, really good. And then he's got one coming out here, and it's, I think it's called Trap in 2024. That New to me. Haven't seen it yet, but... Um, you know, so... But I think it's like any filmmaker. I mean, and I think... And this is going to be super super unpopular, but I'm going to say it anyway because I don't give a shit. I think people that hang their like or dislike for a movie on who the director or who the writer was, I think you're an idiot. Okay? There's nothing wrong with loving a director. Okay? But deciding the movie is good because of who directed it makes you an idiot. Um, John Carpenter did some movies that weren't super good. George Romero did some movies that weren't super good. Um, it just happens, you know? So you have to... And I'm I'm a horror nerd at heart, so I should theoretically love everything those guys did. I don't, okay? And that's okay. So you can't, you can't go into a movie automatically sort of pre-liking it because of who directed or who wrote it. You can't do that. That's just not... And I would argue that it's not fair to the director or the writer. I think that you need to give them the opportunity to prove to you that their movie is good or bad and just be okay with that. Um, there's such a glut of movies that come out every year and so many that I just, I don't understand what they are or who they're for. And more and more, the movies that make tons and tons and tons of money at the box office tend to be the movies that I hate the most. Not hate. Tend to be the movies I dislike the most. Um, the last couple of years, there's been a couple of exceptions. Like Oppenheimer was pretty good. That was a good movie. The Barbie movie was fucking stupid. It was just stupid. I don't know who it was made for. Um, I don't know if it was just knuckle-dragging Neanderthals that that movie was made for. But... By any measure, it was a success, right? It made tons and tons and tons of money, so it's got to be good, right? Oh, I mean, I, I, I turned that movie off. I walked away from it. My wife was watching it, and I'm like, I can't do it. I got to, I just walked away because it was so dumb. Um, I mean, but what it tells you is that there's taste for everybody, and I'm, you know, I'm not going to tell anybody what to like. Just don't go into something thinking that because person A directed it, it's going to be a masterpiece because that's just not the way it is. Think for yourself. Be a free-thinking human being. Don't be a fucking sheep. Anyway. Fair enough. No. So, 1999, uh, in the moment, Sixth Sense was uh, was the shit for all intents and purposes. But, yeah, uh, I guess you've made an argument for it. Actually, I mean, I, I, I kind of have to agree. It's been overshadowed. It's been usurped. By all means, even by his own director, like, I mean, yeah, it's, it is what it is, but for 1999 in that moment, you know, it kind of, kind of did things that I guess people weren't ready for or thought were amazing and it just kind of blew minds and, uh, I mean, you kind of got to tip your hat to it for being that movie for that year, but yeah, uh, yeah. Anything else you want to say about this movie, honestly? I mean, we didn't really go through the plot, but I think everybody at this point knows the plot. I don't think there's anything new we could have said about the plot, to be perfectly honest. And I'll say this again. I don't hate the movie. It's an okay movie. Um, and I do love the fact that it gave us a new director who has got some creativity and who's got some vision and likes to do new things and likes to tread where others haven't. I like that about about M. Night Shyamalan Ding Dong. I like that. Um, and it's why every time he does a movie, I go watch it because I want to see what he's going to do next. But I will also say that he has not impressed me every time. And there's some of his movies that I will just say are dog shit. And I'm okay saying that. But I went out and paid my 15 bucks, and that 15 bucks gives me the right to say your movie's dog shit, if that's what I think. Um, at the same time, yeah, it did some did some ground breaking things at the time um and it took some risks the hard part for me is the risk that it took with the twist risked it having zero rewatchability for somebody like me and that's what it did so um again don't hate it just uh 
It's not going to make any of my top 10 lists for anything ever, but that's okay. And I think I'm more or less comfortable with that. That's fair. That's a good way to look at it. And I don't think that I've actually, um, like I said, I, I think I said at the beginning of this, I, I was actually kind of excited to speak on this movie because I've never mentioned it in any uh, podcast on anything I've ever been part of before. So, um, well, actually, I, I think I did, I did mention it actually. I take that back on one podcast. I did mention this on a, um, a, a Halloween movie countdown thing, but. But yes, it was definitely not a number one or anything like that. But uh, no, I find that fascinating. Like, you know, it, it was just interesting to just kind of like break down for a second and really think about it and be like, how much do I really like this movie? Um, you know, we went through the years uh, and this kind of, I think IMDb actually put this up there. Is, was it was it their top movie or was it The Matrix number one? I can't remember. It was in the top like three, though for movies that year. So, um, you know, I find that kind of fascinating that this movie is like probably just gotten put on that pedestal and just left there. And yeah, you're right. I mean, the rewatchability is hard. I, I like to go back through it and look at a lot of the stuff. Um, I think I said when we talked about it on our, uh, you know, 1999 review, how much I love the setting it being in Philadelphia and the old historical kind of uh, setting, like it being ghosts, like, like I can smell those old houses and everything. Like this movie actually has that kind of, um, it's the opposite of Texas Chainsaw Massacre where Texas Chainsaw Massacre is like hot, sweaty, humid Texas heat and like meat rotting and things like that. And it's just such a nasty kind of, you know, uh, I guess, you know, visceral surrounding, like this movie does the opposite for me. It's old historical buildings where you can smell the wood and it's like, you can feel when you walk on it, it's creaking and it's warped. And it's like these just old city like buildings, even the apartment buildings are old as shit. And I don't know. I, I just, I, I get like a feeling when I watch this movie where I'm just like, I kind of get immersed in it. And I think it's it's just well shot in that way, too. It's not necessarily the story itself, but also if you're going to put yourself in a ghost story, it put you in a setting where every building, every set, like every shot feels kind of creepy and old, like it could be believably haunted. Just because it's like, I don't know, it just has that, I like that ambiance to it in every shot. So that's the only thing I'll say about this movie, too, that to, to give it some credit. OK, well, <clears throat> to your point about putting something on a pedestal and then it gets forgotten, it's like, yeah, people frequently do that with marble statues, right? And every once in a while, someone comes by and dusts it. And that's about all that happens. Um, am I saying that's what happened with this movie? Um, no, I'm not, because from my chair, it never belonged on the pedestal in the first place. So, um, but. You know, as far as whether it's aged out or it's done, whatever, I, 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 I don't want to speak to that because I just it was always just OK anyway. So it's like I I would much rather spend my time preaching about why it was on the pedestal in the first place um, rather than how long it's been there or whether someone's dusted it or not, because um, that's to me, that's a much more fair conversation. And again, last time I'm going to say it, I don't hate the movie. Just thought it was OK. That's fair so, enough. So I think we can, uh, we can probably unanimously agree then that The Matrix is probably the best movie in 1999. Um, no. <laughs> as far as culturally. Uh, there's something to that argument, probably. Um, but, you know, we, we had a list to work with, and I picked my favorites off of it. Um, and the nice part about how we do this is that I got to force you to watch one of them, you know. Knowing, knowing full well from the early voting that I was going to lose this handily. Um, so I got to sneak election in there. Um, you know, still one of my, still one of my top, it, it, I watch a lot of movies, so it's in my top probably 250 of movies I've ever seen. 
you know, um, I because I just really enjoy that story. And I am, uh, I'm still learning a lot about that movie since I've watched it now because of this hmm. podcast. Um, I did not realize it was one of the driving forces, um, the inspiration for the TV show Glee. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I found that out and I was like, wow, that's kind of interesting. So. Well, so that's why you watch and that's why you do the research, right? That's the, I mean, that's the fun of the whole thing, at least um, for me. So I wanted to let our wonderful listeners know that we have already selected another year. Um, and we did it with a random number generator, so we're not cheating. And it just so happens that we're going back 25 more years and we're going to 1984. Um, and I'm not going to dive into it because we'll be here for another two hours if I do that. But there is a plethora of outstanding movies to talk about. Um, so I'm really going to have to do some... Um, I'm going to have to do some research and some notes for next Wednesday just to make sure that we give this the, uh, give it its due because there's a lot of movies on there and it's always, it's always hard to say, well, kind of, for instance, with the sixth sense to go to just mentally write something off. Cause admittedly the first time I sort of just did that, it was like, Oh, it's a sixth sense. Um, so I'm going to, Try to come into it with a little bit of expanded thinking and, you know, give some of these things their uh, their due cause. Um, but I'm excited for that one. I think it's going to be fun. And we'll have to see what uh, each of us comes up with for a top three and then uh, head on into April and uh, chew up some more listening time for our wonderful listeners. Now, do you have anything, Clark, that we would define as hot off the presses? Anything that you have seen that is new, that is fantastic, that everyone wants to watch? Oh my, as far as movies go, um, trying to think of what's going on. I've been actually more focused on the news here recently than I actually have been movies. Uh, uh, fucking history majors. Oh, I tell you. Yeah. I know. And video games, obviously. But, um, nothing uh particularly that i am going to jump on movie wise but i will do a i will do a side note uh about our upcoming 1984 is that this one's gonna definitely flip the script i believe for us because i'm gonna have to fight my heart a lot on this one versus what is actually popular so (laughs) well that is uh Remember, remember that we will do the top 50. We will give our top three each, but your top three does not have to be from that top 50. So you can pull your heartstrings as much as you need to, just to get what you need to say out there. Um, That's why I put Boys Don't Cry on the list, because I think that's a fantastic movie. Um, It is. I think a lot of other people don't think it is, and... A lot of people think don't think it is because of the subject matter. Um, and if that's the case, I think you're just being an ignorant dickhead. And you should enjoy good movies for what they are. The subject matter. Um, I often think if the subject matter makes you uncomfortable, that's even better. That's just me, you know. And I'll be honest, the subject matter makes me uncomfortable. It makes the movie even better because it makes me think. Um, so... That sounds like a plan. So hot off the presses, I have a handful, to be honest, um, but I'll make it quick. Ghostbusters Frozen Empire. Not a good movie. Roadhouse, the remake. Didn't hate it. Really surprised. Didn't hate it. Um, One that is technically been out for a couple of years but it's only recently got a wide release so in my world when it gets a wide release and i can find it that's when it came out um satanic hispanics <laughs> movie that starts out slow and you think is gonna suck and then absolutely does not it is absolutely magical it, i believe it's on prime right now watch that and give it just give it some time because it gets awesome as it goes um and then last night, I saw Late Night with the Devil. And um, really good movie. David Desmond Chain knocked it out of the park. Absolutely knocked it out of the park. Um, nice to see a guy who has been 
playing kind of sidebar horror characters forever finally get his big break and he did a masterful job so i i see even more good things coming from him really really interesting movie um I, everybody pressed me for a score on late night with the devil um and i generally try to wait a day or two before i give something a score i like to let it settle and like, like to let it think a little bit um and for the people that know me as Grindhouse Zombie, they also know that I am fastidious when it comes to my scoring, and I I am not good-natured about it, and I tend to be rough on every single movie. This one was a presumptive 8 out of 10. Um, so I also think it's an indie film, and I think it's either has dropped or is dropping out of theaters as we speak, which is unfortunate, because it did so well opening weekend. Um, hopefully they look at the numbers and keep it going for a couple more weeks um but definitely a good one um if people are, are in the mood to see something interesting because it definitely was um there's a couple others on my list that are new um rami it, that was predictable and it's been done the character was interesting but not a great movie overall um and that's probably the only other one worth mentioning um so that yeah that, that's my hot off the press as of the last uh three four days so um yeah go out watch some movies listen to us um and uh if nothing else keep it real we want to thank you again please check out that's effing weird's uh main channel and remember uh we don't just want things to be watched on the real we want to keep it real <laughs> <laughs> but also, we want things that aren't normal. We want things that are effing weird. How do you feel? Uh, well, sir, uh, I feel like a uh, uh, slice of butter. Big old pile of flapjacks. Do you feel?